last Sunday, I initiated a meditation on one of those values that we have been uh, emphasizing for the life of our church. This is, these are the things that we are aiming for. These are the things that if you examine our preaching and all that we do at Lion of Judah, you will notice that I hope that uh, what we do is oriented toward um, leading us into these values of being a sign to the city, being a congregation that is spirit-filled, being a congregation that is continually in process and in a process of transformation and change, being a church that is rooted unconditionally on the, in the Word of God, being a congregation that even as we call each other to holiness, um, we are also mindful that holiness and sanctification is a process and that we need to be patient with each other. We need to support each other. We need to be humble with each other. We need to accompany each other in that journey. Even when we fall and we fall short, we need to encourage ourselves and pick each other up and continue in that process. And we need to be a church that is filled with the Holy Spirit. We need to be a congregation that emphasizes the power of the Holy Spirit. As we conf confessed over and over again during the time of worship, not by might, not by human power, but by your spirit, Lord. And that we need to be continually cultivating the gifts of the spirit, life in the spirit, fullness in the spirit. And I initiated uh, one further value last Sunday, which was uh, related to a completely consecrated life, a completely uh, concentrated life given over to the Lordship of Christ in our lives, that there is no area of our life that is to remain uh, untouched by the Lordship and the claims of the gospel, that we are supposed to be a people who are totally sold out for the gospel, that we need to live as a living sacrifice. You remember those sermons that I preached earlier from Romans chapter 12, that we are to live our lives as a living sacrifice because, as we have said, it is the only way that we can truly experience the good plans that God has for us, that we are supposed to be always renewing toward a, a total transformation of who we are. That has to be the goal. That has to be the, the purpose of our life. And I said that in connection with this idea of a totally consecrated life, um, we need to live as a living sacrifice, completely yielded to God. And I, I spoke about the Iranian church. You might remember this church that is conquering their nation, even in the midst of such persecution and such repression. The fastest growing church, apparently, in the world. I assume that that takes into consideration China, even, proportionally speaking. It is a church that is uh, hidden. It has no churches out in the open. It has no leadership structure. It is simply believers who have taken seriously the call of the gospel and are willing to lay down their lives for the kingdom of God. And God is using them with great power and manifestations of his spirit. Because that's what happens when you decide to live a life completely consecrated to the Lord. Then the power of God begins to manifest itself in your life. I said that authentic Christian living is passionate Christian living. It is living that brings you to be on fire for God, totally committed to his will. One's entire life lived out in terms of our submission to the word of God. Christianity is not a part-time thing. It is a 24 hours, seven days a week endeavor. It is an immersion in a lifestyle. And I believe that in every believer's life, I'm just continuing on with that topic because I left half of the sermon out. And I think it's so important that we meditate on that, that we really get that into our hearts, this idea of consecrated living. This is why I'm going to, take, I'm going to pick up on that. Rather than leave the sermon half finished and go on to something else, I want to really develop it even further. So I'm still on that same topic of a completely consecrated life. In every believer's life, there has to come a time, a moment of what I would call spiritual crisis. Spiritual crisis. It is a moment when you finally make a decision to plunge fully into the life 
of a disciple. I mentioned that word with great deliberation. To live the life of a disciple of Christ. How did the disciples live out their life? They, they lived following Jesus everywhere he went. They lived focusing on him, his way of operating, his way of being, his character, his power, his relationship with the Father, his total yielding to the Father's will. They totally submitted their life to him. They gave up their jobs. They gave up their careers. In my mind stands out that moment when the Lord um, calls Peter in the boat. And it says that Peter left his nets and followed Jesus. Matthew left his uh, profession and followed Jesus. Paul gave up his career as a Pharisee and followed Jesus. And this is what we are supposed to do. We are supposed to live out this life of a disciple continually concentrated on one thing, which is to become more and more like Christ. And that is a full-time proposition. It is something that should consume every moment of our lives. And there has to be a moment of spiritual crisis. Why do I say that? Because many of us, we come into the church, maybe sometimes we have grown up in the, in the church, our parents were Christians, our grandparents were Christians, or somewhere along the way we made a decision for Christ, and we came into the gospel, but many of us have never come to that point of crisis where we actually are confronted head on with the claims of Christ. And we go through a process of asking ourselves, Am I really willing to live like a Christian? Am I really willing to make every area of my life subsume? That means bring under every area of my life to my identity as a Christian, as a believer. To die to everything that I consider important and profitable. Every relationship, every dream, every vision that I have for myself, every pleasure that I allow myself, and to bring it all under the heading, under the lordship of Jesus Christ, and to live out each day from the moment that I wake up, when I take my first cup of coffee, when I get on the bus to go to work, when I'm there in the factory, or driving the Uber, or in, in, um, in the office, or in the classroom, living as a disciple of Christ, living as a martyr for Christ, living as a witness for Christ, crucifying my flesh, continually in agony, trying to bring myself more and more into alignment with the values of the kingdom of God. Everything in my life, my thoughts, my last thought when I go to bed, my dreams are conditioned even by my struggle, my mental life, my aspirations as a human being, my marriage or my singleness, my family life, my financial life, the way I invest my time, my freedom, all of it subsumed, put under the lordship of Jesus Christ. My entire life lived out in the light of the values of the word and the kingdom of God. And there's an agony to that because you know that you're always falling short. You're always aspiring to more and more. And you're always, you're, you're never quite getting there. But you live that life of holy agony, not a, not a, a neurotic agony, I say, it's not an agony that, that brings you into condemnation. No, it, it, is, it is a desire, a yearning to be more and more pleasing and useful to the kingdom of God. And everything that you do, everything that you live is in the light of your Christian identity and your aspiration, that goal that you have to become more and more like Christ. And so the Christian life is a life of agony. Yes, it is. It's a life of sweet agony, I would say. It's not a life that diminishes you. It's not a life that leads you into condemnation because you know that you have, you're, you're approved already. I mean, you can't fail the test. The agony that you live, you live it under the understanding that you are destined for heaven, that God loves you, approves of you, and he's pleased with you, even with all of your warts and all of your deficiencies. And yet you, you just want to serve him. You want to please him because he, he, you're in love with him. And you are grieved when you don't achieve all that he wants of you. And it's living in that, like that living sacrifice, you see? Because they're, 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 you are consuming energy when you're aspiring and not achieving what God wants for you, and you are agonizing, you are consuming energy. Just like a sacrifice is being consumed by the fire on, their, uh, on top of which it is. And in that same way, we are consuming ourselves. But it is a sweet consumption. 
we, we are never consumed, we are never worn out. We are always perpetually as a living sacrifice before the Lord. And, and there has to come a point when you embrace that kind of living. When you say, you know what, enough of living a half-hearted life. The Puritans back in the 17th century understood that. And they, and they used to emphasize a lot this idea of bringing every believer to a point of crisis. They had to sweat out their uh, Christianity. They had to come to a point of, you know, that, that sort of giving over to the Lord. And we've lost that sense of that moment of crisis. And I invite you to bring yourself to that moment, to ask the Lord to bring you to that moment of holy desperation. It's almost like the Holy Spirit has to bring us to that point where we desire to be pleasing unto God. And we have to become desperate for that. And we have to emphasize that. So I ask you, pray that the Lord will bring you to that moment of complete consecration to the Lord. When you die to all your dreams of personal gain and individual fulfillment in this world and determine to live for Christ alone and for his gospel. At that point, when you come to that point of crisis, your whole identity, your reason for living will be looked at through the lenses of your Christian faith. Your outlook will become the outlook of a believer. Everything that you live and experience will be interpreted in the light of your Christian aspirations, your submission to Christ and his claims. Anything less then that kind of attitude is not authentic Christian living. It is mere religion. Jesus will not settle for anything less than complete surrender to his lordship in every area of your life and my life. And he made that clear. Amen. He made that clear. Matthew chapter 10, verses 37 through 39. He said it in very graphic terms. Anyone who loves their father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And he was speaking about the highest kind of love. You can imagine to a, uh, a Middle Eastern culture, the love of father and mother, the respect that you give to your father and your mother. And he's saying, if you love them more than you love me, then you're not worthy of me. Anyone who loves their son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. He's just using examples. Anyone, uh, he would say, anyone who loves their profession more than me is not worthy of me. Anyone who loves uh, their husband or their lover or their fiance more than me is not worthy of me. Anyone who loves their money and their aspirations for a career more than me is not worthy of me. Anyone who loves their sexual identity, their sexual pleasures, more than me is not worthy of me. Anyone who loves even their, let's say their ministry, more than me, because sometimes you can fall into idolatry, even within ministry, is not worthy of me. Whoever does not take up their cross and follow me is not worthy of me. A fully consecrated life is a life of crucifixion. It is a cruciform life. It has the shape of the cross in it. Because it is a life of crucifying your desires, your plans, your future, your pleasures, and putting them under the claims of Christ in your life. And this is the problem. Many people don't want to be crucified. Many, many of us don't want to give those areas that we consider paramount in our life to the Lord. If you're not willing to take up your cross and follow Jesus, you're not worthy of him. Whoever finds their life will lose it, and whoever loses their life for my sake will find it. That's one of the most powerful paradoxes in all of Scripture. When you lose those things that you value, when you lose those things that you consider totally essential to your identity and to your life, when you're willing to give them up for the Lord, you know, paradoxically, ironically, then you find what they are supposed to provide. Many people are not willing to give up one area of their life because they think, if I give that up, I, I, I mean, that's, it's not fair. That means so much to me. That's who I am. That's what I am. That's what I love. And so I'm not, I can't give that up. It's unfair of God to ask it for me, ask it of me. Because it gives me pleasure, because it gives me a sense of identity, because it gives me a sense of fulfillment. Well, you know, the Lord says, give it up for me, and you will find that sense of identity. You will find that sense of belonging. You will find that sense of solidity below you as you walk life. You will find that sense of destiny 
and purpose. You will find that joy that you think what you are withholding from the Lord is providing you. You will find it in a full way when you give it up for me. As Abraham gave up his son Isaac, in his mind he gave him up. All that he aspired to be a father, to have descendants, to have spiritual glory. The Lord asked it of Abraham, and Abraham was willing to place it before the altar of sacrifice. As he did that, the Lord said, now, because you have not withheld your son, your only son from me, I will give you all the dreams that you have had. I will make you a father of nations. I will make you a spiritual patriarch. You will have descendants. That, those descendants that you thought you were sacrificing when you gave up your son, I will give them to you in such a way that if the sands of the earth could be counted, your descendants would be able to be counted. When we give to the Lord, that is, that is one of the key dimensions of the Christian life. Whatever you sacrifice and give to the Lord in his name, for his glory, in a spirit of sacrifice and acceptance of his lordship, it will return to you in incredible sorts of ways. Multiply. The joy that you are seeking in life, the fulfillment, the, the expressions of the power of God will be returned to you, multiplied, and rendered with great interest because you have trusted in the Lord. You have been willing to die to self. And this is why the, light, the, the, the Bible calls us over and over again. Put Jesus in the throne. Put him first in your life. There's a passage in Romans chapter 12, verse 11, where the apostle Paul, in that same passage where he says, live like a sacrifice. He says, never be lacking in zeal. You know what zeal means, right? It means ardor. It means um, commitment. It means uh, passion zealousness, jealousness for the Lord. Never be lacking in zeal. In other words, you got you to gotta measure yourself every morning when you wake up. You got to take your, your temperature. You got to take your pulse. How's, how am I doing today? Am I in love with God? Am I in love with his word? Am I feeling intimacy with him? Do I feel his company? Do I feel his support? Am I committed to the Lord? Uh, does the church make a difference in my life? Do my brothers and sisters provoke in me joy when I see them and when I, and I live out the Christian life with them? You gotta, you, and, you, and if you don't find that you are enjoying it, if you don't find that you are passionately committed to your Christian identity, then you got to take stock. Where am I? And you got to go plunge yourself deep again into prayer. Seek the Lord. Sit down somewhere and ask him to... Enable you to feel his presence again. again. Never be lacking in zeal. And this is the alternative. The alternative to be lacking in zeal is this. But keep your spiritual fervor. But keep your spiritual fervor serving the Lord. There are other translations that speak of be a glow in the spirit. When is something a glow? When is a piece of uh, charcoal a glow? When it is on fire. When it is hot, it is so hot that it emits a certain level of light. Keep your spiritual fervor. Be a glow in the spirit. There's another translation that says, be fervent in the spirit. The word fervor is related to the word fever. When do you have a fever? You know you're hot. When a person has a fever, they're hot. You touch him. And they got 102 degrees, 101 degree, 100 degrees. They have a fever. And so the apostle Paul is saying, you know, keep your spiritual fever. When you have a fever, your body gets hot. So the idea is to have and to maintain a spiritual fever always. To always be hot in the spirit. You see, uh, lukewarmness is not an alternative Coldness is definitely not an alternative for the believer. We're always supposed to be hot in the spirit. We got to keep our spiritual fervor. And that is, uh, that is something that requires a 24-hour-a-day commitment. You know, many of us are just content. We come to church, ah, you know, I'll go. I don't have anything else to do today. Or if we don't feel like it, we don't go. If we want to give to the Lord, we give. If not, that's okay. You know, we, we live a lukewarm Christianity. The Bible is speaking to us about living in heat 
24 hours a day. And we will not be consumed. We will be like that fire that uh, Moses experienced. There was a fire that, that burned, but it would not consume what it burned. It would not consume itself. It was holy fire. The fire of God will not consume you. The fire of God will not extinguish you. The fire of God will not exhaust you. The fire of God will not debilitate you. The fire of God will strengthen you. The fire of God will give you life. And that's why you need to seek that fire. You need to live on fire for the Lord every day of your life. It's not just for pastors. It's not just for professionals of the faith. It's not just for people who need to preach a sermon on Sunday. It's for every believer. We should never be lacking in zeal. We should never lose our spiritual fervor. We should always be aglow in the spirit. At Lion of Judah, we will always emphasize, emphasize a hot spirituality. We will emphasize zeal and total commitment to the Lord. Even as I preach this sermon, this is what I am doing. You know, we, we want to encourage you. When we have those times of prayer, we had a wonderful time. We, we went, for example, to um, the uh, service on, uh, not service, it, it was a time of prayer uh, last, um, when was the last time I was there? Friday? I think it was. I, I've lost the time right now. Uh, um, or Wednesday. Wednesday night we had the we had the English and the Spanish and the uh, and the people from the uh, ten days of prayer com, uh, contingent up there. It was good to see many of you. I want to see more of you. Uh, you know, the call for prayer should be a call to all of us. We need to be praying fervent in the spirit. We need to consider the times that we spend before the Lord as privileged times and we would love uh, to see the english ministry become a praying ministry uh, a, a ministry that you know when there's a call and it happens to conflict with uh, your latest uh, netflix series that you're watching you just put it aside come you come it's cold and, and it's windy outside on a, on a tuesday night or whenever you come because you need to keep your spiritual fervor. You need to keep your zeal. You need to keep your spiritual temperature. Your greatest joy is to be in the house of the Lord with your brothers and sisters. You are living for him. And, and you, you have learned that when you protect, you are overly protective of your rest and your personal private life. Actually, you lose it. It's funny. When I am tired and I come to the temple, not just because I'm the pastor, but because I, I, I would do that. I, I, I am a pastor because I paid the price before that. Before I was a, a pastor, I was a lay person. And I say this without any pride, but I, I, I gave, I, I served my pastor. I supported him. I, I was there every day that was necessary in the church. And that's when the Lord calls you. The Lord calls you when you are like Samuel, living inside the temple. You are, you, are, you are committed to him. And that's when the Lord gives you your calling. That's when the Lord speaks to you. That's when the Lord gives you dreams. That's when the Lord confirms who he wants you to be and how you want, him, how you want to serve him, how he wants to be served by you. It is as you live that life of total consecration to the Lord. And we will commit you to that. You earn your life when you lose it. You rejoice and enjoy and receive when you put aside your pleasures and you give to the Lord. The Lord does not honor lukewarm believers, my brothers and sisters. The Lord does not uh, reward lukewarm spirituality. We have the, the important teaching in, in the book of Revelations when the Lord speaks to the church in Laodicea. It was a very prosperous church. It was a church that had many of the benefits that we had. They had air conditioning. They had nice cushy seats. They had special effects. They had nice uh, high definition uh, screens. They had good sound systems and good worship leaders and good musicians. You know, but they were lacking something. They were lacking fervor. They were lacking commitment. They were lacking desperate dependency on the Lord. And the Lord rebuked them. 
And he said to them, these are the words of the amen, the faithful and the true witness. Why does Jesus identify himself as the true witness, the faithful witness, the amen? Because these words symbolize decisiveness, commitment. Jesus had committed his life to the will of the Father. So he comes as he who is faithful to a church that is unfaithful. And he says, I know your deeds, that you are neither cold nor hot. What a damning accusation. He couldn't think of something worse of which to accuse these Laodiceans. You are neither cold nor hot. And there are many believers who are like that, unfortunately. We are neither cold nor hot. We have not defined. We are neither atheistic and completely rebellious to the word of God, but neither are we completely given over. Neither are we keeping our spiritual fervor keeping ourselves, ourselves zealous for the Lord, completely sold out for the gospel. We are neither one nor the other. We come to church on Sunday. We do the symbols and the rituals of a, of a religious person, but our life is not hot. Our life is not on, in fever for God. And, and God says, I, I rebuke that. I do not accept. You love your father and your mother more than you do me, and I discern that. And therefore, your sacrifice is not acceptable to me. I wish you were either one or the other, says Jesus to Laodicea. I wish you were one or the other. Then at least you'd have an identity. So, because you are lukewarm, neither hot nor cold, I am about to spit you out of my mouth. Oh, Lord. I am about to spit you out of my mouth. Have you ever taken a good swig of lukewarm water? Does it, doesn't it provoke nausea? And that's what we, many of us, God tolerates us. He will save us because, I mean, we will be saved because it's not by deeds. But I tell you, I mean, the, life, the, the Bible is very ambiguous about that whole thing of deeds and who is truly consecrated to the Lord, who is truly converted or not. It's a, it, you know, I would much prefer to not have to worry about that by living a completely sold out life to Christ. Salvation doesn't depend on on deeds yes but somehow deeds do reflect salvation and so if your salvation doesn't reflect or rather if your deeds do not reflect your salvation then you know you should have a right to be a little wary that's all i'm saying i won't get too deep into theological quandaries but it is a problem in the bible so because you are lukewarm neither hot nor cold i'm about to spit you out of my mouth this fervor this passion for the things of god it is the only attitude that pleases God. The alternative is Christianity as a commodity. That thought came to my mind last Sunday. The alternative is Christianity as a commodity, something that can be traded or sold according to convenience, something that can be manipulated according to our preferences and desires. Wheat is a commodity. Milk is a commodity. Cars are a commodity. You can sell them. You can trade them. You have, you have a sovereignty over them. Society moves them as, they, as it pleases. But Christianity is not a commodity. Christianity is not something that you can manipulate, that you can trade in. You don't possess Christianity. Christianity possesses you. You enter into Christianity. We don't, we don't have the right to choose what we will believe or practice. As Christians, these things are defined for us in the Bible. We do not have the right to, to manipulate and to shift and change and morph and, and uh, process Christianity to our preference. Christianity manipulates us. It, it, it morphs, it changes us. We don't have to, the right to reject or modify what the Bible says, says just because it doesn't please us or, or because it goes against what we would like to be or do, our sense of fulfillment in this life. As committed believers, we live our life entirely consecrated to the principles and demands of the Word of God as it has been defined in the Scriptures. The Scriptures have the totality of sovereignty over our lives we do not manipulate them they manipulate us our christian faith governs and defines our life 
our identity, our destiny. That means that many times we will have to choose and accept things that are totally repugnant to us. Things that we say, God, how can you allow that? How can you ask that of us? How can you define justice in those terms? How can you define that as true and, and, and worthy and good and beautiful and happy? How can, you def- how can you ask that of me? And yet we bow before the Lordship of Christ. We take our reason and we lay it at the feet of Christ. The scandalous claims of the gospel. Because this is what the word says. And because I'm a soldier in the army of God. And I will salute whatever he asks of me. And I will worry about the, the, the difficulties and the contradictions and the scandalousness of what he's asking later. But meanwhile, I will enter into it with great trepidation at times. With great sadness and a sense of tragedy that I have to bow to that. But I will do it. Interestingly enough, I will find my life. I will find my life. I will find my life as I sacrifice it. And the problem with much of modern Christianity, particularly in the West, is precisely that we are not willing to pay the price that authentic Christian living requires. We have too much to lose. A person in Africa or in Latin America or in the Amazon or in Mongolia often does not have a whole lot to sacrifice. What do they sacrifice? The monotony of the plain where they ride their horses, the the coldness of their tent, the lack of uh, movies and and Netflix and uh, TV and, and great entertainment and iPhones and iPads. They don't have those things to sacrifice. So in a way, you know, it is easier. I'm not taking the merit of what they're doing to sacrifice because they're not sacrificing a lot. We, as Western, modern Christians, we have so much to sacrifice. We have so much to sacrifice. A highly educated, developed intellect, all kinds of gadgets and machines that make our life very happy and simple and easy and convenient, yes, Uh, nights uh, that we can populate with all kinds of entertainments and all kinds of pleasures, weekends that we can do all kinds of things, drink our Bloody Marys on Sundays in our brunches that we have and read uh, great magazines and newspapers and ride in beautiful cars and go out into the countryside. We have all kinds of things. We need to sacrifice all those things. We're not willing to pay the price. Like the rich young ruler, we are rich. Even the, the poorest of us have more wealth than wealthy people used to have in the 17th or 18th century. Even to this day, huge portions of humanity. And the Lord asks us to sacrifice all these things. That is why in the modern Western world, it is so difficult to find a Christianity that's, that is fervent and aglow in the spirit. We have so much to sacrifice. But the Lord says, if you sacrifice your wealth like the rich young ruler, you will find that peace that you are looking for. And you will find my power. I really feel that I am using prophetic language here as I say to you that God wants to do great things with our congregation. God wants to do great things in not just for us because we don't deserve it. We do not deserve it. All the glory goes to him. But God wants to do something extraordinary. God wants to do something transformative, but we first have to die. We first have to convert ourselves into empty vessels where the oil can be poured so that God can do extraordinary things. He's inviting me to die. I am trying, I'm doing my best to cut my throat and, you know, let, let the blood seep out. Forgive the graphic, what I want to say in nature. I, I, I want that. I want to die so that he can then live through me and in me. And you must do the same. We must consecrate ourselves because tomorrow the Lord will do great things, says the Lord. <laughs> Lukewarm Christianity will not do anymore. This completely unsatisfying, effeminate, imperfect, radically imperfect, ineffective, shameful Christianity, its day is coming to a close. It is there now. And God is asking us to climb on top of the wood of the sacrifice like Isaac did. Isaac did not protest. He knew what his father was going to do. He was probably 17, 19 years old. He knew what was going to happen. 
He was, he was, he was going to become a martyr. He was radically obedient, just as his father was radically obedient. He had to climb. It doesn't say that his father had to force him, drug him, or knock him out. No, he, he, he climbed on the altar of sacrifice. He let himself be bound like Jesus did. Isaac is an example of Jesus who gave it all. And so we have to do the same thing, people of God. In modern Christianity, we have the shell of Christianity, but not its substance. And then we, we blame God when our churches do not grow, when we are living frustrated Christian lives, when the world remains indifferent to our faith, or when the promises of God are not fulfilled in our lives. The only way to complete fulfillment and effectiveness in the kingdom is through death to self. Complete commitment and consecration to the Lord of Jesus Christ and his word. There's so much to say because this is the center of the gospel, what I'm preaching. But I want to leave it there with you. I, I hope to provoke in you a holy hunger and, and dissatisfaction with where you are. As I am feeling with where I am. And a sense of expectation. It is worth sacrificing for. It is worth investing in. People of God, if you are here this morning, do not leave without a, a sense of disquiet in you. Of, of great dissatisfaction with where you are. And yearning to be more for the Lord. Yearning to be used of God. Yearning to be like a torch consuming itself. In the middle of the darkness, the world needs torches, human torches, lighting the way for those who do not know Christ. And we want to be that individually and collectively. And so I pray that the Lord will help us as a congregation to be that kind of people. Why don't you bow your head right now where you are? I would hope that right now from the depth of your soul will be a rising, a clamor, a cry to the Lord. Father, I know that there's more to give. And I bring myself to that place of complete yielding to you. I, I am clamoring to the Lord right now, here where I am. It's been my cry, especially for the past few days. It had always been my cry, but more than ever. Bring me to that point. Bring us to that point where we can be empty vessels, clean vessels, like the widow's pots into which your oil can be poured. Oil to light lamps. Oil to anoint. Oil to nourish and make possible feeding others oil that can comfort and heal I want to be an empty vessel Jesus a capable capacious vessel where your oil can be poured we want this church to be a vessel for your glory we want to be authentic believers. We want an authentic gospel to be preached. Father, we yield to you everything that we are, our preferences. Forgive us, Lord, for not selling it all and giving it to you that you might use it for your purposes. Help us to be a church that lives out an authentic gospel this morning and always, Lord. I commit, say that to the Lord, I commit, I commit to you, I commit to your kingdom, I commit to your claims, I commit to your lordship, I commit to the values of your word, I commit to your government in my life, let your kingdom come. If you haven't received Christ, this is a moment where you can just say, Lord, I yield my life to you, I yield my life to you. I give myself over to you. If you haven't done it, take this moment. Take this moment to offer yourself as a living sacrifice before the Lord. I will not measure any longer what I give to you, Father. I will not measure any longer 
how I dole out my portions to you and to your kingdom. I will give it all preemptively to you. Everything that I am, everything that I have, everything that I own, everything that I have acquired, everything that I have come to be up to this point, I yield it all to you and to your claims, Lord, this morning. Jesus, help us. Let your kingdom come. Let your will be done on earth as it is in heaven, Father. Let the nations bow before the Lordship of Jesus Christ. Having heard the gospel from a crucified church, from a crucified people, Lord, begin with us. Have your way in us and forgive us for not giving ourselves more quickly to you. We offer ourselves this morning, Father, even if, as I announce this lofty gospel, I know that I am not up to that measure. But help us to be a church that will announce that gospel. Help us to be a church that will live out that gospel, Father. Help us to be a people that will bring honor to your name, that you will deem us worthy of sending your spirit and your gifts into our midst, that we might do the works of our Savior. We offer ourselves to you, Father. Come, Holy Spirit of God. Let your will be done. Let your will be done in Boston, in New England, Father, this difficult nation, which is New England. Let your purposes be realized here. Begin here in the hardest of places, Father. Begin here, Lord, and shame the devil. Shame the hordes of the enemy. Here, where hundreds of years ago your word was mentioned with great reverence and your values were affirmed by a people who took you seriously, Father. Willing to lay down their lives as they traveled into this arid nation. And you honored them. And you lifted something extraordinary. Lord, do it again. Do it again, Father. We invite you, Holy Spirit, to do it again, Father. We believe that you will do it. And here we are. We offer ourselves as possible instruments that you might use for that purpose. Thank you. We honor you this morning, Father. Lead us from this place on fire, passionate, zealous, fervent for you and your kingdom. In Jesus' name, amen.